everybody. Welcome to Read Science, where my co-host Jeff and I interview and just chat with authors of popular science book and engage in other types of science writing and try to understand how they make these topics that are oftentimes complicated, uh, compelling and engaging and understandable to the general public. Today we are doing our genomics edition and we are so excited to have here three writers uh, that we can count on to explain the field of genomics to us. Uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce Misha Ankrist. Misha, would you say hi? Hi, thanks for having me. So Misha is the author of the book, Here is a Human Being. This is the hardback. Uh, you know what, I got this from the library because I lent my other copy to my <laughs> students, so, whoops. Uh, but that's good, I'm getting the word out. So, um, Misha, you work, you are an assistant professor of the practice, uh, of the practice, interesting, it, yeah. for the Institute of Genome Sciences and Policy, uh, and you're interested in the intersection of genomes and society, especially as it is manifest in the nascent personal genomics movement. And of course, this makes sense because what precipitated the writing of this book was the fact that you are personal genome project subject number four. And we will get into more details about that um, and your book there uh, in just a few minutes. Uh, I'd also, as my great pleasure, to introduce uh, Matthew Herper, who is a uh, prolific and incredible writer over at Forbes. And I'm looking at his uh, description here on his Forbes page and it says I cover science and medicine and believe this is biology century. He's covered science and medicine for Forbes from the Human Genome Project through Vioxx to the blossoming DNA technology changing the world today. Um, and I hopefully won't embarrass you by saying when I tell my genomic students to read your articles I keep referring to you as the incomparable Matthew Herper. So <laughs> would you say hi please? Hi. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, they're, they're going to think, you know, I'm a fangirl, you know, because I say, oh, be sure to read this. Oh, look, a new article by Matthew. So, because I don't think a lot of them are on Twitter and all that stuff. So, it's my. He team. is incomparable. Yes, definitely. So, um, and then I'm so excited uh, that to. Can be good or bad, Misha. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Oh. Well, it's in the good way. <laughs> Uh, so I'd also like to introduce uh, Kevin Davies, uh, Kevin A. Davies, and you have to look it up by author because I found there's also a Kevin Davies who's a footballer, right? That's right. <laughs> and I was like, well, that doesn't look like the picture on Twitter. <laughs> 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 so <laughs> Kevin is, um, he was the founding editor of the first spin-off journal of nature called Nature Genetics. Uh, how many years ago was that, Kevin? 20? 21. 21, that's amazing. Okay, and uh, so he uh, then moved on to um, be, be the editor of BioIT World. He's written several books, um, and the book we are looking at today, or actually he is now a publisher of Chemical and Engineering News, and um, let's see, he is the author of this book called The $1,000 Genome, uh, The Revolution in DNA Sequencing and the New Era of Personalized Medicine. Um, he wrote the book, uh, Cracking the Genome, and also uh, the book... Breakthrough. Breakthrough. I couldn't find the name right away, but it's about the discovery of the BRCA1 gene. Uh, Kevin, uh, I also discovered, has um, helped with uh, movie uh, science to help, uh, mm. the, hopefully, the movie about the BRCA1 gene called Decoding Annie Parker to explain uh, the science very clearly to the audience. So, so we'll, we'll, I we tried, will talk, I tried. We, yeah, we, we, we will talk about whether they listen to you or not. So, if, uh, <laughs> if we can get some tips for improving the dismal exactly. nature of science in movies, that would be very handy. Yeah, we, we could spend 60 minutes just on that topic, but uh, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get there, we'll get there. Yeah, we'll have to do a show on that, I yeah. think. So, Jeff, why don't we let you, since I've done all the talking up to now, we'll there let you go. ask the first question. This is, ahead. I'm trying not to be intimidating. Look at all this, you know, biological power here. Uh, since I am the, the physical scientist in the room who has never come closer to anything living than helium, uh, I get to ask the, uh, as, we, as we said, I get to ask the Dr. John Watson, and this is 
uh, Watson as in Sherlock Holmes and not Watson as in uh, DNA, which is easy confusion to make here, although I have always had an interest in X-ray crystallography, which may sound inscrutable, but it's related to that. Two, I have two not softball questions, I think, because they are the very big questions here for the, the person who hasn't done this. And I want to start, since we're calling this our genomics edition, I, I said to Joanne a few days ago, could I, you know, without going too far off, call genomics all that quickly becoming vast area of biological science endeavors that involves something uh, to do with sequencing genes? And you can say yes or no. And this is, if we can do this one, the short one, then we'll get to the long question. Well, they're related, but I think, uh, you know, gen organisms are made up of cells, and cells contain uh, a DNA, and the DNA, the package of DNA is called the genome. In humans, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes and 3 billion bases of DNA, the familiar four letters, A, C's, T's, and G's. Obviously, for many applications and for many areas of study, we need to sequence the genome. That was what the Genome Project was all about, mm -hmm. the Human Genome Project. It was to sequence from the tip of chromosome one all the way through to the end of the, the so-called sex chromosomes and figure out what, where the genes were in between and how many they were, and from then on, uh, go on and figure out uh, their function. But there are many aspects of applications of genomics. There's uh, you know, epigenomics and quantitative genomics and uh, uh, m many other examples that don't necessarily involve sequencing. But, but mm. the field develops innately, inherently, with uh, progress in DNA sequencing. We can talk more about that as we go along. OK. Would either, uh, would either Matthew or Misha like to add to that? I would just say genomics is kind of industrialized genetics. It's genetics at a much more systematic and um, some industrialized level. And to some degree, it's also a word that looks great on grant applications and uh, funding attempts for companies. So <laughs> not, like not entirely snarkily. You know, we, we invent new words so that we can get people to buy things. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I, I would say... Um, that maybe at this point the term genomics, at least in my institution and in my opinion, it, it feels like a bit of an albatross mm -hmm. because we associate it with human germline DNA. Uh, sorry to be uh, species, species <laughs> um, and of course, we're really interested in organisms, especially humans as a whole, uh, their phenotypes, their epigenomes, their behavior, all of these other things. And so I, I often feel kind of hamstrung by the term because I think what we're... Genomics at maybe its most useful implies big data. And that's what we're, I would say, probably collectively most interested in. So there has a, there's, a, there's an interest in uh, having an actual sequence of somebody's DNA, and that's at the, the root of the next question. But there's an interesting um, historical convergence here, too. It's like, why do we, you know, one reason that we sequence an entire genome is because we finally can. Uh, and so we've seen, we keep seeing this in these, in the biology discussions that we have, and it's true in the physics discussions and all of science discussions that when we have new tools, we use those and we look at new things and we see new stuff and exciting things happen. And so finally we get to, you know, the dawn of whatever year it was and we're able to do this. And then that answers part of the question. It's like, okay, it's, it's a very large, exciting, project, and I agree to that, to say, let's do an end-to-end -end sequence of some human genome, and then the, the question is, why? Uh, and, you know, there are, there are lots of things, the technology and stuff, but what, what might we someday get out of that? But what, you know, I've read interesting and unexpected stuff that people are already learning from doing that, and one thing that we don't learn, you know, for the popular people is, well, once we do that, we don't know where all the genes are. 
that's a very naive sort of thing to do, but there are many useful and lovely and interesting things. So first essay question, and uh, you know, starting with Misha over here on my right, would be what are we getting out of it and what can we get out of it? To, what can we look forward to? Oh, boy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, elementary, my dear Watson, and uh, you know, move on. I'm glad he starts with you, Misha. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I I would, I guess the first thing I would say is I think from the vantage point of 2000 or even 2005, um, in many ways we have not gotten out of it what we were hoping for, mm -hmm. um, and that is the discovery of genes of large effect that mm -hmm. contribute to common diseases like mm -hmm. diabetes, heart disease, schizophrenia, that sort of thing. Right. Um, so that has been a disappointment. Um, and if my fellow panelists disagree, I hope they'll get in my face about it. Um, at the same time, what I think we are getting out of it is uh, a much more granular understanding of Mendelian diseases, mm. that is, rare diseases that are caused by mutations uh, of large effect. Um, so there are quite a number of efforts. I'm involved with one at Duke uh, where we are sequencing sick children and in some case sick, sick adults. Um, other people are sequencing healthy adults or centenarians, people who have lived very long. Um, and we are finding uh, alleles, that is versions of genes, that are important in these traits. Um, and I think the uh, perhaps the most palpable thing is in many cases we're able to end so-called diagnostic odysseys. Uh, so this was initiated by the sequencing of this young boy, Nick Volker, in 2009. Um, and finding a causative mutation and actually mm -hmm. uh, leading to an effective treatment for his um, heretofore undiagnosed uh, autoimmune problem. Recognizing those mutations means you have at least then two sequences to compare with each other. Is that true? Yes. Uh, so there's still a good deal of um, con I don't want to say controversy, but discussion about um, how do we know a smoking mm -hmm. gun when we yeah. see it, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Um, and we're still, I would say, um, disappointed and, and too often heartbroken that even when we find something, we don't uh, necessarily have a way to mitigate uh, the child's condition, um, but I think, you know, judging by the parents I've interacted with, um, they are universally grateful to at least have something, a diagnosis, yeah. the name, yeah, yeah. and a community of uh, other families going through similar things. So, Matthew, you can, you can uh add to that if you want, but, but Misha brings up the question too of when you uh, feel like you know, you're on the precipice and you finally start a new technique, and this has happened over and over again in various branches of science, disappointment goes with it because you expect one thing to happen, but then later on uh, you may be vindicated because you'll find out that all sorts of other exciting things have happened uh, well, instead and new understandings. I think there was a difficult um, 
the Human Genome Project and the Solera effort were kind of a difficult, in, back in 2000, were a difficult thing because I think a lot of people knew that um, that you weren't really going to get that much of medical interest from having a single genome. And mm -hmm. all the cases Misha's talking about are cases where we have, you know, th this data is really useful when you get a lot of it. Yeah. So it took DNA sequencing to go from a million dollars per person to a thousand dollars per person before this really starts to come into wide use. I think sometimes we miss uh, the useful stuff that is emerging from these efforts too. I mean, we talk about these rare diseases and diagnostic odysseys. Sometimes a, disease, a gene from a rare disease uh, can have a huge effect on a common disease. That's how we got statins. They came from mm -hmm. the study of a rare disease called FH. And there's also a new set of drugs from a different form of FH, which is a gene called, caused by a gene called PCSK9. There's also a form of the gene that causes you to have lower cholesterol and a lower risk of heart disease. <laughs> yeah. And there are drugs for that in late-stage trials. So, I mean, it, all this biology is slow. We have this kind of sense as we've kind of all been um, lied to by the PC revolution and yeah. by social media and Tumblr that, that innovation just happens in some some kid in his college dorm room does it. And mm -hmm. Biology doesn't mm -hmm. work like that yet. and may never work like that. Um, but I do think that, that there's been there's been some noticeable events and sometimes there's a real lag. Um, mm -hmm. and the, the Mendelian disease stuff is amazing but it is kind of also it's, it's, it's ultra rare diseases and you know, so there, there are those caveats. Well then maybe Kevin you can add to that because I think you were the one who mentioned that not only are we talking about technology that I want to get to but we're talking about uh, big data has an important part to play and and large teams of people which is not unfamiliar to me with high energy projects yeah. and things but this is this is a understanding these things and most of what a lot of what swirls around genomics now is involves large groups of people big understanding big data and a fair amount of technology right now right yeah well and that's how the human genome project got underway at the beginning I suppose I think for some of your viewers it may be worth just quickly recapping how we got the mm -hmm. first genome before we talk about personal genomes and the thousands upon thousands that are being sequenced every year going forward as the price uh, continues to tumble. Um, and the first Human Genome Project was a very much an international consortium, a collaborative effort borne by the frustration that people like student, grad students like myself and Misha at the same time were facing trying to find a particular important disease gene. It might have been muscular dystrophy mm -hmm. or cystic fibrosis that uh, we couldn't find because the, the maps that we had available were the equivalent of, I don't know, you know, a Google Earth map that just shows the continent of the United States uh, and no detail. You could see yeah. a few lakes and a few deserts and a few rivers and a few metropolises, but you know, that was about it. You, you just, and if you're trying to find a mutation on that scale, you're basically looking for a football field somewhere mm -hmm. across the breadth of the United States. <laughs> so we needed to produce the equivalent of a street map um, and so that you could scroll in and zoom in exactly on where the particular uh, problem might be. And, uh, and that was the effort that uh, Jim Watson, uh, the, the Nobel laureate, uh, helped persuade Congress, in part because they knew their constituents were increasingly going to be facing these problems. You know, how do I treat my, uh, my Alzheimer's disease or how do I save a loved one who's developing cancer? Uh, we needed a roadmap. We needed an encyclopedic inventory of, uh, of, our, of, our, of the genome. Uh, and that got underway, but there was no book in that really until Craig Venter, as uh, Matthew just mentioned, launched Solera uh, in 1998. And almost overnight, the whole thing became this uh, fascinating race because now you had an mm -hmm. individual who was sort of mounting a hostile takeover of the Genome Project, saying he could do it years earlier than the, the planned 15-year mm -hmm. timeline, yep. do it much cheaper, basically inviting the academic scientists around the world to go off and do the mouse genome or something like that. You know, we, I, leave it to us guys, we'll take care of the human genome. Um, but Craig was in a bit of a bind. He wanted to not only run a, th a profitable company by licensing this information to pharmaceutical companies and biotech companies, of which there were more and more uh, being, being launched, um, but I think he also ultimately wanted the academic uh, and scientific prestige, perhaps even ultimately a mm -hmm. Nobel Prize, that comes with being the person that sequenced the human mm -hmm. genome. 
And you can't have it both ways. You can't keep the data under lock and key to sell it to an exclusive audience, but also yeah. make it available. Uh, and that's where the human genome, they did two things. They stressed that their data, the consortium stressed their data would be free and open to the public. Mm -hmm. And they also, it took a few weeks to mount the, the, the to mount the forces, but uh, they got extra funding from the Wellcome Trust and the NIH to, to basically compete more or less on level terms with what Solera was doing. And interestingly, the company that was bookending, that was bankrolling Solera, agreed to sell their sequencing machines to mm -hmm. anybody. It would have been a new, very interesting scenario if they said, you know what, we're just going to keep our machines to our own spin off company or sister company, <laughs> Solera, and not yeah. share them with the Genome Project. Uh, history might have been a little different. And then, of course, I'm sure your viewers are familiar that uh, President Clinton sort of hastily drew a kind of a declared a truce and held up the hands of Collins and Venter at the White House in June 2000. And, um, but, you know, Craig is, uh, and Craig at that point realized, okay, Solera's not going to make money licensing information because the Genome Project has pretty much trumped us uh, on that front. Maybe we can become a drug discovery company or a proteomics company. And he realized his heart wasn't in that, so he went back to uh, academic pursuits with his institute and now is uh, pursuing another genomics field, synthetic genomics, yep. uh, launching a company. So um, uh, that's the brief history of the Genome Project. And there are many books. I did one book, but many for future mm. people interested in this and future historians, there are many people who've taken there may not, there's no definitive book on this. Um, I'd love to get involved with doing an oral history of the subject. I think that would be fascinating while the folks are still alive. But there are many people who've written, um, you've got the, the sort of the liberal uh, free the data account from uh, the Sanger yeah. Institute in Britain. You've got the fly on the wall at Solera account from James Shreve. And you've got many people in between. My book was somewhat sympathetic to both sides and uh, um, I, for better or worse. I understand that uh, Matthew might be looking for a book project. You could <laughs> 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 Talk to him about that. Does that from what, from you know, what you say, I'm sorry, but from what you say, Kevin, is it does it seem fair to say? And I don't mean this in any sort of diminishing way. That uh, we, you know, we say we will be, you know, before whatever time we will sequence from end to end a human genome, and and there it is, and we will make this available. Well, that's that's a grand thing, and it's a fairly simple thing to say, but is it in a way not such a useful outcome as? when he uh, when Watson promoted all of this as the fact that in order to do that there are all sorts of exceedingly useful things we have to know and learn how to do and this is a, yeah. a good target to, yeah. to promote that to yeah all oh, abs things absolutely De definitely the latter it wasn't as if the human genome project overnight transformed uh, drug discovery I think as Matthew said you know and uh, alluded to. I just I want to make a quick note here. The hottest yeah. cancer drug on Wall Street right now came out of <laughs> Solera. Hey. I mean, it wasn't actually. I don't think it was actually genomically derived. Genomics derived, and it was after Craig, but it was actually a Solera compound that is now at a company called Pharmacyclics. So. Well, that's almost surprising, isn't it? Yeah. So <laughs> something practical. Is it too is late to happening. get in. <laughs> It's really too late to get in. <laughs> oh, no. Story of my life. <laughs> okay, but Joanna, to, to, to your question, the Genome Project, you know, it it, it uh, immediately sort of inspired uh, something called the Hat Map, where we mapped the extraordinary amount of genetic variation between different populations. Uh, right. Now, some 50 million or more. I don't know what the latest number is. Uh, specific units of DNA that vary in different people across across the world, and of course it. It helped inspire uh, the the revolution in sequencing technology because uh, the price tag yeah. for the Human Genome Project, that first genome, was about roughly three billion dollars spread over 12, 13 years. And now, as as we've discussed, you can now sequence a genome for, in terms of the actual chemicals, at any rate, uh, just a few thousand dollars. Not quite the thousand dollar genome, but we're almost there. Yeah. Joanne, I have one more very simple question that's related okay. to these. Uh, and, and I want to see if anyone is bold enough to tell me in two minutes. Uh, I remember that I'm a, a physicist, so I need the physicist's understanding of how you actually sequence a genome. Yeah, well, and I think it's important to say what happened between, you know, Venter, you know, the way the NIH, uh, the <laughs> consortium was originally doing it, and then Venter said, come on, you could do it this way. So, and yeah, yeah, so I'm I'm not looking for the answer that says, well, we use this machine called a sequencer, and we prepare the sample this way. What is going on in there at some level? Because 
you've got these enormous numbers of things, and the time is certainly part of that, but how do you determine with some precision uh, which of these... Uh, Bases. Well, I, I, I'll, I'll very quickly. The, the technique, the technology that was used for the genome project was something called Sanger sequencing, and that is that still has a, a niche role in some areas, uh, mm -hmm. forensics, for example, and, and uh, is still considered widely the gold standard for many clinical applications. But it has been largely uh, 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 subsumed by uh, 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 next generation sequencing. And there are many different flavors of next gen uh, sequencing. Uh, the most popular, uh, the, the most of the uh, labs and companies in the market right now using next gen sequencing use rely on one of two systems. One by Illumina, uh, which came out of a British company called Selexa uh, uh, several years ago, and another by Life Technologies, which uh, bought a company uh, uh, pioneered by one Jonathan Rothberg uh, called Iron Torrent Systems. Uh, mm -hmm. The latter uses essentially is measuring uh, sequencing by pH, it's, which sounds extraordinarily. Mm. Uh, it, it, when I first heard that you could actually sequence <laughs> DNA by measuring pH, that was incredible. But each time a nucleotide is added to a growing chain of DNA, a proton, or in other words, a hydrogen ion, is released. And ah. if you use some pretty sophisticated uh, um, t technology and you can detect the release of that, uh, that uh, ion, uh, you know when a base has been added. And if you know which wow. base was in the mix, you can then compute the, the sequence. Uh, Illumina is essentially taking. Uh, adding, uh, uh, looking at the addition, the growing sequence of millions upon millions of tiny beads of DNA, each each sequence identical in each bead, and as you flow in the chemicals, you you use uh, fluorescent dyes to mm -hmm. uh, identify which bases, which of the four bases has been added. Okay. You take lots of photos, you add the bases one at a time, and you build up a sort of a stop motion picture of of the sequence. So mm. those technologies mm. have been uh, around now for three and maybe five or six years, respectively. Uh, and we wait now for the next generation of sequencing technologies, perhaps nanopore sequencing, which will truly uh, break that $1,000 genome barrier. Yeah, wow. so that, that, the, nanopore, the nanopore one, I think, you know, when I think of that, it's like as if you asked a little kid, how would you read a piece of DNA? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, well, I would just pull it through and go, Read, 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 and that's what nanopore technology is, right? Mm. It's just not as easy as doing but, that. I mean, I think the physicist answer might be they all, all these methods use the pairing, the ATGC pairing of DNA to figure out what you're pairing with. Mm -hmm. that I'm be. getting that, but it's, it's, and we know that's the way we would do it in the, you know, the physics textbook, and then we would know that's not the way it actually works, except that's the way it actually works, it sounds like, and if you can that's do... That's the way it actually works. Sort of, sometimes, yeah. sometimes, they have, sometimes there are colored tags on the DNA, or sometimes, I mean, mm -hmm. there are a lot of... We didn't even touch pack bio, because it worked completely differently, and no one used <laughs> yes. it. But, yeah, uh, no, right. it's really cool. Yeah, but molecular pH measuring is really kind of <laughs> phenomenal sounding. Well, Except let, they, let can't, me... they can't get... They have trouble when they're the same DNA letter in a row. Yes. yes. So that is a problem. Let me leave this subject... Um, at the American Society of Human Genetics meeting last year, I bumped into Kevin, and he said, do you want to come over to the Oxford Nanopore booth with me and see what's going on? <laughs> and I said, you know, how, how could I refuse? <laughs> uh, and so we went over there, and sure enough, it was um, a real dog and pony show. Um, and they had this little dummy kind of cartridge set up, you know, so the idea being that this thing is about the size of, I don't know, uh, your sunglasses case, um, maybe smaller, and it's got a USB on it, and you would just shove it into your computer. Um, but, uh, you know, so there, were, there was a mob there, um, but we had this kind of surreal conversation with the CEO. We were asking, you know, how much it cost and how fast the data would be generated and when the data would be available and how accurate it would be. And they weren't really answering any of those questions. So <laughs> I'm wondering, Kevin and maybe Matthew can update us and let us know where we are. 
Yeah, I, 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 is, is are answers to any of those questions available yet? Well, that's Matthew's job, so I'm going to let him take first. Time. No, <laughs> no, we're still, we're still, everyone's still waiting. Everyone's really wondering, but no. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, Jeff and Joanne, I think this was uh, Oxford Nanopore really kind of burst onto the public stage about 18 months ago when they presented at a scientific conference in Florida, and the crowd really just went bananas because they were, as you said, Joanne, you're talking about a, a, a protein, if I can do the camera yeah, thing here. You you know, it's, it's a ring, a, a, a naturally occurring protein. They've engineered it, and the idea is you simply thread the DNA through uh, under an electrical current, and because the four bases differ in size and shape, as they wriggle through that pore, mm -hmm. they will block the current by a different amount. And if you can, again, <laughs> apply some very fancy hidden Markov models and fancy mm -hmm. informatics uh, and equate the uh, blockage in current to the pattern of bases going, the sequence of bases going through the pore, bingo, you've got a phenomenally cheap DNA sequencer because you're not mm -hmm. using lasers or fancy dyes and you can, the problem isn't to speed up the sequencing, it's to slow it down so that you can, you can actually make sense of each base uh, one at a time. Uh, they had said 18 months ago that they would have launched, uh, the plan was to launch sometime uh, this year in 2013. We've heard nothing about mm -hmm. those plans since then. Uh, so it does appear they're a little bit behind schedule, but I guess, you know, when they come out with this, particularly with this uh, fancy USB thumb drive sequencer uh, that Misha uh, described, uh, you know, they want to make sure it's right. So, uh, you know, the rest of the field is still, I think, uh, uh, certainly optimist. Most people are still fairly optimistic that, that this is going to be worth waiting for, but the wait is getting a little painful right now. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a, there's a problem every new sequencing company has now, too, which is that Illumina keeps getting better, yeah. and everybody's using, using Illumina, and yeah. Illumina is becoming the clinical standard. So you have this problem of becoming a niche. I mean, they thought of Oxford Nanopores. Maybe they'll have really long reads, which means instead of most of these technologies right. chop the DNA into little pieces and you got to puzzle them back together. Mm -hmm. Right. Maybe they'll have really long reads, and that'll be the... But will they initially be able to come out of the box and be better than the thing everybody already has installed? That's that's hard. I mean, that basically... Uh, the thing that Rothberg did um, that was very smart with Ion Torrent with the pH was he made it cheap, and he made it something that people who were priced out of DNA sequencing could buy and instantly sold a lot of machines. It became the main real competitor to Illumina just because he found a niche. Um... So it's kind of almost as much a business problem. Which, by the way, Kevin, have you heard anything about Jonathan now that he's left life? <laughs> no, no. T tell us, what's he doing? I have no idea. That's why I'm asking. <laughs> you know, and and so jo Jonathan's one of those people, so when you read the history of the Human Genome Project and all these things, there are a lot of scientists who are motivated by very... Um, uh, altruistic, charitable, whatever reasons. Like they even take a complete turn in what they were studying, in, you know, because maybe a family member had something go uh, wrong. Uh, I think there's, there's a lot of interest in the personal aspect of these stories of the people involved with the Genome Project and, and the development of sequence I, technology. I, I don't think Rothberg's motivations are entirely altruistic, Joanne. Well, I think, I, I think right now he's doing, anybody, but, yeah, he's yeah. doing well. Uh, but he did tell the story. He, he was the founder of Curigen, one of these uh, genomics uh, companies that briefly cashed in on the, on the, uh, the sort of the fruits of the Genome Project in the 90s, you know, um, uh, and, the, and then in, entered hard times. But he spun off a company called 454, Life sciences, because one of his uh, during the birth of one of his kids, uh, there were some complications, and he he claims I don't know how true or apocryphal this is, but he claims that he was in the uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, NICU uh, waiting room that night, pacing up and down. He needed some something light to read, and he clutched into his briefcase and pulled out an IT magazine, and there was a a picture of a transistor on the cover, and he said. Bingo! That's it. That's what we need for sequencing. Uh, we've got to make it smaller. We've got to do it in, in parallel. And um, it's a great story, um, so, and I, I trust that it's true. So, so let's talk about this just a little bit. This this uh, concept of stories and science and things like how the Human Genome Project, when Craig Venter came in, well, he was working with the main project, but he said, "No, we're, I'm going to do this differently." Like how his this sort of clash actually made the Human Genome Project more interesting. It got journalists excited. It got the general public excited. And, and what does this do for science overall? 
Uh, and do we always need that to make science interesting to the general public? Well, I, I think back, uh, you know, I remember you know, one of the th items about the double helix, the race for the double helix that excited people was that there was a race. There was always the threat that Watson and Crick could be scooped by Linus Pauling or maybe uh, Rosalind Franklin would uh, uh, actually build a model and, uh, and trump them. Mm -hmm. um, and like I say, the Genome Project was this boring pedestrian humdrum government funded project until Venta said, no, I'm going to make it mine. And, uh, and then, this is obviously pre-blogs pre and Twitter and so on, all the muckraking happened really in the pages of the New York Times and the Washington Post. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was every week or month, it seemed, there was rival press releases going out. And there was a lot of animosity there still is to Venter because of uh, some of the things that he did or was associated with during the 1990s. He was associated during his time at, at uh, NIH with one of the first efforts to mass patent human genes. Mm -hmm. I don't know that that was his choice, but that was the NIH uh, doing that on, on his behalf. Um, and then, of course, he was one of the first people to cozy up to Wall Street and to, to VC funding. And uh, through an uh, association with human genome sciences, I remember when the Wall Street Journal, uh, the New York Times uh, published the fact that his stock options were worth about $12 million in, I don't know, this was 1993 <laughs> or something. And I think people collectively thought, what? You can get that rich just cloning and sequencing genes at random? God, you know, I hate <laughs> you. Uh, and, uh, and he's, you know, so... And he has so, a really so, nice... Go uh, ahead. I think he has a really nice boat, but <laughs> he does. <laughs> uh, and and has always had a really nice boat. But the uh, I think something harmful happens from that kind of race conversation, which happened with embryonic stem cells too. Which is that everybody who is on each side starts promoting the technology as being the be all and end all of everything. Mm -hmm. Even when it's not, and that's one of the reasons we had all these stories years later. Of, oh, the Genome Project didn't do anything. It's because both sides are that that kind of dynamic has the harmful effect of you're not really talking about the technology, and it kind of gets inflated as a side thing. You know, in the same way that we had embryonic stem cells were going to make Christopher Reeve walk again in ten years. You know, mm -hmm. kind of absurd uh, propositions. I actually appreciate that extra perspective here. Um, before we go on to, to a few other things, I do want to ask uh, Misha and anybody else who wants to join in, but I do want to ask about the Personal Genome Project um, and, and then to, you know, why, why, why this project? This is George Church. Why this project? Uh, why did you join? And, and this dawn of being able to get your genome sequenced. And what does that mean for us? Does it mean anything? And if everybody could have an ion torrent and could <laughs> genome sequence everything, should we? You know. <laughs> and, and, and why don't we, even if we did? And I know I know the answer, but you know, let you guys explain. So let's start with Misha, because you were actually subject of the project. Well, you know, if someone gave me an ion torrent for Christmas, <laughs> I think I'd probably return it or re-gift it. <laughs> re-gift. Um yeah, so uh, Kevin mentioned the 1990s. Actually, Kevin, uh, when he was editor of Nature Genetics, published the linkage paper that was sort of the main bit of my thesis. I was studying um, uh, a birth defect called Hirschsprung's disease. And... Um, you know, I was always struck when I when I was doing that work as a graduate student and later as a postdoc that genetics was something um, that even though we all have DNA, um, there was there was something there was some firewall between. Uh, those people who got to do genetics and those people who had genetics done to them. <laughs> um, and so, you know, if you didn't have the letters after your name or the white coat, then you had no business uh, looking at your own DNA, let, it, let alone anyone else's. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that always kind of rankled me a little bit. Um, you know, what were we sort of hiding? Uh, and 
I remember distinctly in January 2006 when there was this cover story in Scientific American uh, called Genomes for All, written by this guy named George Church at Harvard, saying, you know, the cost is falling and pretty soon we're going to be able to sequence large numbers of people for not that much money and uh, we ought to talk about what that's going to look like and, and who's going to have access to that information, which is all well and good. And then he kind of took it a step further saying, what if we actually had a cohort of people who were willing to um, just make their own genome, their own genomes public, no strings. And uh, I thought, boy, this guy is crazy. I have to meet him. Um, and uh, I, that was sort of the, the genesis of, of what became my book. Um, and so, you know, f I would say for the first three years or so, um, he was not really taken very seriously. Uh, it might be even longer than that. And, and to this day, there are people who don't take him seriously. Um, but he got a cohort of 10 people, and I badgered him until he relented and let me become one of them, <laughs> uh, who would be willing to do this and see what happened. And then um, after very patient petitioning of the Harvard IRB and several other hospital IRBs in Boston, uh, he got approval ultimately for 100,000 participants to enroll um, and thus far has enrolled, I don't know, 3,000, maybe more by now. Um, and so the basic idea is that these people will have their genome sequenced at no cost um, and they will make the data public uh, and anyone and everyone can have access to those data. Um, but in order to enroll as a participant, you have to pass an exam uh, that covers not only genetics and genomics concepts, but um, some of the kind of ethical and social questions about what it means to have your genome public and, mm. and uh, whether this is something that you're really comfortable with. Could so, I, I'd like to ask Misha a question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so, in your book, you, you write, it's a really moving account of what it's like to get this giant spreadsheet of data and not necessarily know what it means. <laughs> and I'm wondering if your, if your perspective on that has changed. I mean, I assume you've been continuing to get information from your PGP data uh, since, the, since, the, since the book came out. Have you, what have you learned? Have you learned anything? Either biological or metaphysical or <laughs> <laughs> well I mean you know this is the thing is as I said I I'm part of this whole exome sequencing effort at Duke the exome being the two percent of the genome that codes for proteins and I think what those families learn from us uh, is much more palpable and moving and meaningful than anything I've learned about my own genome. Um, I think for a healthy, a generally healthy adult, um, yeah, there's a possibility that you will learn a about your risk for a devastating late onset disorder, um, but uh, if that does not emerge, then what you're confronted with are some things that are uh, interesting. Uh, if you've 
trained as a geneticist the way I have and, and Kevin has. Um, but probably you are unlikely to learn stuff that is going to radically transform your mm -hmm. life or your health care. I mean, it, it's, it's very hard to generalize because even now our sample size is still fairly small. And, you know, we do have cases, even in the PGP, uh, John Lowerman, who's a reporter for um, Bloomberg, was a PGP participant and found out about a medical condition and sort of went on his own little diagnostic odyssey. Um, and that's certainly bound to happen to some mm. uh, tail of the distribution. Um, but I think for me, the... I think for most PGP participants, if I'm not being too presumptuous, you know, we want to we want to contribute to science and we we also want to have access to the data um, that emanates from us. Um, so that's kind of the exchange, I guess. And to the extent that we can perpetuate that and find a cohort and build a cohort of people for whom that is an equitable deal, that's what we're trying to do. I'm not sure if I answered your question. Yeah, I mean, the science still has a long way to go, but if, if the technology continues to get cheaper and cheaper, uh, you know, as the founder of 23andMe, uh, Anne Wojcicki, uh, proclaims, there will come a time in the not too distant future where everybody is sequenced potentially at birth. We already screen every newborn. You know, we prick their heel. We do this thing called the Guthrie heel stick test and screen for 30, 40, 50 different uh, potentially uh, d devastating genetic disorders. Why stop there? Why not? If sequencing becomes less, just a few hundred dollars, why wouldn't we just get, get the whole sequence and and then we can have a sort of the ethical debate? Well, do we just hand that CD or that? flash drive to the parents when they leave the hospital, mm -hmm. or do we yeah. put it in some sort of lockbox? Um, that's, that's an interesting um, discussion. I, I think for people who uh, aren't about to volunteer for the Personal Genome Project uh, run by George Church, although I would urge them to take a look at it, there are really two ways now that you can get access to your genome. Um, 23andMe, of course, is the one true standing uh, direct-to-consumer genetics company. There were a whole bunch back in the 2007, 2008, but most of them have either been gone, gone, changed business models or been swallowed up and the, the technology's been do, doing other things. Quarter of a million or more people have uh, signed up for 23andMe over the past five years. They're pushing on for a million uh, by the end of this year. Yeah. That's the goal. And it's, it, the price has dropped to just $99 and uh, no uh, monthly subscription fees anymore. And you learn a great amount, uh, and it's great fun, uh, I would stress. You learn about something about your, your ancestry, where some of your forefathers may have come from. <laughs> you learn about your predisposition to different traits, uh, um, uh, some of which are fairly trivial and fun, some of which are a bit more important, such as the ability to process drugs like statins that Matthew mentioned. Uh, and then you learn about whether you carry uh, risk genes for a growing number of uh, diseases, uh, including Alzheimer's disease, including some mutations in the BRCA1 gene and a whole slew of other genes. So, um, you know, it's not for everybody, but uh, there's, there's, uh, there's a, there is some positive information that you can extract from that. And if yes. you want to go the full, full, full in uh, and uh, have your genome sequenced, uh, the company we talked about earlier, Illumina, now runs, I think it's twice a year, a, a, a conference where for $5,000, uh, you not only register for the conference, they will sequence your genome in its entirety <laughs> to gold standard quality, and they'll throw in an iPad with the results and a nice browser <laughs> as well. So uh, the $5,000 genome is literally here, you know, it's mm -hmm. within reach. That's, um, really that's where we are yeah. today. So let me ask uh, one, uh, Matthew, have you had your genome sequenced? Because I know these no. two guys have. No. So. The other thing is, I read both of your books and sort of giggled at the fact that you both bring up the fact that you were balding. <laughs> 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 I was just like, what? 
you didn't need your genome for that, guys. <laughs> I, I, I know. And so, so that I thought represented this. Okay, nice. So you're predis, but you know that already. So a lot of us, we just happen to know already, you know, that we've got high blood pressure or that you know Alzheimer's could be a possibility in our future and things like that. So. Uh, but I think it would still be interesting. I would be interested in being a PGP participant just because for the science, just for science, you yeah. know. And, right. and I'm thinking, you know, uh, the things I've been through in life, I'm not worried about an insurer not insuring me because <laughs> they found out I may get something. So let's talk quickly because I know Matthew needs to leave pretty soon to catch a phone call. Um, but I, I want to talk about... Uh, Angelina Jolie. So let's just talk about BRCA1 for, for uh, probably for the rest of the time. We'll probably take her. So we've got Angelina Jolie. We've got the Myriad case. And we do have that, that movie, Decoding Annie, that uh, uh, I do want to talk about. So let's talk about Angelina Jolie really quickly and then and segue into Myriad, uh, the, seat, the Supreme Court case. So uh, Matthew, do you, do you want to start? Oh, well, I thought Kevin would be the one to give a good description of Braca. He, he would because he has a book. I, on the, I mean, I think the Angelina Jolie thing, it was, a, it was a courageous thing to do. I think one of the more important things to watch, it, came, it brought a lot of awareness at the same time as the Supreme Court decision on some, but not all, of the patents that Myriad has on Braca. And also, I think this movement coming out of Randy Scott, who was an old competitor of Craig Venter's back in the genome days, is now running a company called Invitae to free the data to make these data to make public equivalents of the private database that uh, that Myriad has been able to keep around that mm -hmm. gene could be something that's really important if not simply on its own as as a as a thing to watch as we move forward in um, in dealing with this information I mean to me a lot of the issues around BRCA are actually kind of they're settled. It's just that Braca got grandfathered in to like the bad way of doing things. I mean, I don't think that any company could build the patent the state around a gene like Myriad did, but that's because the world changes. Maybe maybe Kevin can give us uh, the the quick thumbnail of why it is that we're talking about Angelina Jolie and what the Angelina Jolie thing is and what relationship it has with breasts and movies. Yeah, uh, no, BRCA1 has been dominating the uh, the news. So yeah, Jolie came out and uh, uh, talked bravely about uh, and very candidly about uh, her her personal decision to uh, prophylactically uh, have a, a double mastectomy based on family history and having had the gene test. But the reason the the, the BRCA1 patent went all the way to the Supreme Court is that for the last uh, 15 years or more, Myriad, which ultimately and f was the first to find the gene in 1994, uh, patented it. That's not unusual. Many academics patent genes. It's what you do with the patent that's the question. And Myriad refused to, uh, to, uh, to share uh, or grant access to anybody else to, uh, to offer testing, full-blown sequencing testing on the genes. So you basically had to go to Myriad if you wanted to uh, sequence uh, BRCA1 and, and mm -hmm. 2. Um, and women, uh, sued, uh, along with other parties, sued uh, on the basis they were denied a second opinion, uh, which I think every, and most people would say they were, they certainly would have the right to. So the the, the Supreme Court decision to unanimously overturn the uh, the actual gene patents was, I think, almost overwhelmingly supported by uh, the mm -hmm. scientific and medical community. Um, that afternoon, after the decision came down, at least a couple of uh, genetic diagnostics companies uh, came out with press releases saying and on Twitter saying. We're going to launch our own test for a fraction of the three or four thousand dollars that Myriad charges, but since then Myriad has announced they are going to sue uh, at least some of those companies because they still have a whole bunch of patents that were not touched by the Supreme mm. Court decision, and a very interesting uh, patent battle is still about to be waged on whether they can still uh, have have access to those uh, to those royalties. So this means when 23andMe or, or even the Illumina sequencing happens, get, can they not even, uh, or before the, the ruling, can they not even say you have the BRCA1? Well, 23andMe is only looking at, I think, three specific variants last time. Okay. I so they're not doing sequencing. Not a full sequence I, of that. Not team. a full sequence. And there's a school of thought. I don't know if this would hold up in court, but there's a school of thought. But if you do whole genome sequencing, you take somebody's entire genome, chop it up, 
and sequence little bits and then put the jigsaw together, since you're not isolating the BRCA1 gene and screening for it in sort of in isolation, you're there by you're not valid you're not violating uh, yeah. Myriad's pattern. That's certainly that school of thought. But some people will maybe sequence the gene, but then uh, not uh, not actually do the analysis for fear of uh, Myriad coming down on them, at least before this uh, decision. And and Misha, you you were actually at the Supreme Court that day, were you not? I was. Um, so I, people always ask me what that experience was like, and um, if you remember uh, the famous David Foster Wallace essay where he goes on a cruise ship, it was called A Supposedly Fun Thing I'll Never Do Again. <laughs> um, I got there about 4.30 a.m., and I still almost didn't get in except for one of my colleagues actually had a press pass and gave me his number so that I could get in. They only let 50 civilians in, so, um, you know, uh, it's not a, it's, it, it's, it's somehow a peculiarly American process to go and watch the Supreme Court argue, but it's not a, <laughs> It's not a great um, shining example of of our system of justice, I don't think. And then, you know, of course, you get in there, and uh, the justices are using all of these metaphors to describe science. You know, chocolate chip cookies and uh, medicinal plants from the Amazon, and all of this stuff. Um, and uh, I was kind of shocked and frightened by all of it. Um, and uh, <laughs> yes, I, I give it's, them... It, it's well worth digging out the uh, the transcript of the of the oral arguments, because yes. they go all over the shop. It really is. This is... Guys, this is the best we can do. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Terrifying. I gotta go now that... I know. I was gonna say thank you. Do you have anything you'd like to add before you disappear? No, thanks for scaring me, Misha. I, I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> Any time, buddy. <laughs> Thank you, me Matthew. I appreciate Thanks, Matthew. it. Thank you. <laughs> so so uh, there's so, uh, another idea, Joanne. We have to do a an episode on science in the courts. Yeah, oh, be scary. Geez. Well, but... I know some good people who write about politics and science that could be. Yeah. But um, I would like to talk about really quickly because we yeah. got three minutes. So I yeah, so I went and watched this movie, Decoding Annie, because I wanted to cover for Decoding science. Annie Parker. Annie Parker, right? Uh, I keep shortening it, maybe for Twitter. Um, <laughs> and and it, so, it, like I said, it's the story of this woman who's had cancer three times. Two of them seem to be BRCA1 related. Uh, a breast and ovarian family members, of course, had died. And uh, so the thinking, when this was happening to her, of course, no one wanted to believe that a multifactorial disease like breast cancer could possibly have a genetic component. And, um, and there's Mary Claire King who could see that this is a possibility. So we have this very brave woman, this really engaging story of this woman, but then also woven in with some of the science, including Mary Claire King. Uh, and when I watched it, I sort of went, ah, you know, some I know these concepts, and I didn't think some of them were explained very well, um, but I understand from you that you actually uh, were called on to try and help them explain, <laughs> get the timeline right, and, and I think yeah. even if timelines were wrong, that would go, would go over the heads, but what I felt yeah. was more of an egregious error was the fact that this stuff could have actually been explained properly and clearly so people would understand the science a little bit better, but they they didn't take... This, do, this doesn't bode well, Joanne, this doesn't bode well since I'm credited as the genetics consultant on the movie. But, so, but, the uh, thing, they, but, but it's not, but the thing is, I looked at your notes right. versus what I remember watching and I was like, right. they didn't listen as well. <laughs> directors have to, they, they producers, directors have to make decisions. I should say, I think, just for background, uh, this film was shot uh, 18 months ago, nearly two years ago now, on a minuscule budget by a, by a highly respected but not terribly well-known uh, director named Steve Bernstein. Mm -hmm. um, and he got a tremendous cast. Uh, Mary Claire King is played yes. by Helen Hunt. Yes. And there are alums from uh, The Office and The West Wing and Breaking Bad. Uh, Aaron Paul is, uh, has a role in it as well. Samantha Morton plays the title role of Annie Parker, who was one of the first women in North America to be tested for the BRCA1 gene. 
And so I got a call, I don't know, a month or maybe two months before they started shooting uh, from the director who'd found my first book, Breakthrough, gathering dust in some library somewhere, and um, saying, wow, you, you wrote about the, the whole story of how Mary Claire King, throughout the course of the late 70s and all through the 1980s, believed that there might be a gene that explains the predisposition to breast and ovarian cancer in some families, at any rate, when the whole scientific community was highly skeptical. But she stuck to her guns, and uh, sure enough, in 1990, she mapped the genes. So the director of this film has woven in the story of Mary Claire's um, saga uh, in between the main story, which is the family saga of, of, of Annie Parker. But I wrote them and called in a whole series of notes about, you know, you can't do that. You don't have food parties in the middle of the lab. You know, we try to keep food out of the lab and um, <laughs> correcting details. But the, at, at every other scene in the lab, they wanted to have these deep philosophical conversations about mm -hmm. what oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes were, mixing metaphors, and I, I tried to say, you know what, they weren't looking for, this is a race to find a little bit of real estate on, on the human genome. It really didn't matter what the function of the damn gene was, because we didn't know what the function of the gene was. We didn't know if it was going to be a nuclear protein or a membrane protein or a cell signaling protein. That would all come later. Right. So you One don't thing even at need a time. that. You don't even need that. It's simply about finding strategies to get close to that uh, piece of real estate that we now know is on chromosome 17. And uh, they, took out, they took on board some of my suggestions. Others, they, uh, I guess, in the, because of time or whatever, uh, they decided to ignore. That's, I guess that's how Hollywood works. I, I think so, too. And I think, you know, in the interest of making it a human story, you know, maybe it's okay if you don't get the science right. But, right. Uh, it, you know, it sort of it hurts, hurts the heart. I, Science. I'm shocked. I'm shocked to hear you say that, Joanne. <laughs> well, once so, the film has secured its distribution deal, and maybe you'll touch on this in your in yeah. your uh, review, jo uh, Joanne. Uh, yeah, I'd I'd love to sort of uh, uh, come clean and say, you know, this is confessions of a science consultant. Uh, that that blog <laughs> is waiting to be written. Right, and there, there, there is actually. So you were lucky to be found where you were found. There is actually the Science and Entertainment Exchange. Is that? Triple AS, and uh, you know, but there's there is actual groups out there that that want to pair scientists with people making movies. Say, we've got scientists for you. Come use us. You know, come come ask us questions, and we we'll help you get the science right. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Uh, so so I think I think that's that. Well, I want to give a very quick plug to another movie that I think would really interest this audience if they've stuck with us for the last sixty minutes, which is. Uh, <laughs> The Perfect 46, which is, uh, I've seen a preview of that, uh, not not released yet, still in the editing room, but uh, a filmmaker named Brett Bonowitz has uh, written a very thoughtful piece about a, a company not unlike a 23andMe that uh, in the not too distant future is able to uh, essentially weed out uh, genetic disease and raises lots of discussions about uh, eugenics and uh, the perfect race and so on, uh, until, of course, something goes terribly wrong <laughs> and uh, start to pop up. Um, he doesn't get, he doesn't try to explain, and maybe this is a wise uh, uh, decision, not, you know, how this could actually happen. So it's more about the sort of philosophical and medical and ethical debate. Um, but I hope he gets funding for that and finds, finds uh, success on the film, uh, the festival circuits uh, over the next uh, six to 12 months. Mm -hmm. Oh, right. yeah. So I could show my classes something other than Gattaca. Right. Yes. <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> I did tell Brett uh, there weren't enough car chases for me. There were no car. There was no action. It needed a little more uh, uh, sex so, and violence. Yeah. But, uh, you know. We want that. So, so we we are over an hour. Not that that matters, since we're not like in a time slot that uh, sponsors are paying for anything. But I don't want to hold you guys up. But uh, this is the time where uh, we we like to ask. Um, do you have anything else you would like to add uh, to our viewers, uh, or for archiving forever and ever on YouTube, or however long forever means on YouTube? Uh, so, Misha, is there anything you'd like to add that we didn't ask or maybe you'd like to say? Um, well, we, we touched on it probably an hour ago, um, just this idea of using narrative to explain science. And, and obviously with the movie discussion, it, it comes up again. Um, I have a colleague at Duke in, in philosophy who... Um, every time I see him reminds me he, he's a philosopher of biology and and always takes pains to remind me that stories are not science Misha um, and I 
you know, I, I don't disagree with that on its face, but um, I think stories are absolutely essential to the communication of science and um, and uh, we need more of that uh, and in many ways while we may be um, in the final throes of science journalism as it was constructed 10 or 20 or 50 years ago um, we're really in a golden age, I think, of science communication. Um, and there are so many amazing and instructive and enlightening and entertaining stories about science that remind us about uh, not only the amazing work going on in the lab, but, but the way this stuff makes its way into the world. Uh, not always the way we would like it, um, but uh, I can't emphasize enough how important I think it is to to tell those stories. Well said, and uh, I would just like to add: Go buy "Here Is a Human Being" by Misha Angus. <laughs> oh, while you're at it, buy uh, a and the thousand dollar Gino. <laughs> here we go. Here we go. These are the hard hardback covers, but they're both out in paperback now, right? So. Uh, yeah. your, your books came out almost exactly at the same time, didn't they? Yeah. Yes. Uh, so, I don't think I got a paperback edition. Misha has one up on me there. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I thought I saw, but maybe that was the audio edition or something. Ah, uh, could be. Different. I did get an different. audio edition. Yes. Yeah. I think uh, I think Joanne and I are are readily going to agree with you, Misha, that storytelling is really a a core part of what science is about. It's it's a particular way that we tell stories about understanding the universe, and uh, and that's that's important. I think it's it's silly to say it's it's not about stories because uh, it's maybe not solely about stories, and we have to tell them in the right way. But storytelling is certainly a very important part of it. Okay, so what I'll do is uh, we'll say goodbye to our audience for now, and you guys sit tight for a second, and uh, thank you guys, everybody out there, for joining us for our uh, genomics edition of Read Science, and we'll be back later with some other fantastic uh, authors to join us. Thanks, Joanne. Thanks, Joanne. Thanks, Jeff. Thank and you, guys. Jeff. Bye. Bye. Bye.